Hello and a warm welcome to Politics Today. And in this programme today, we will be looking at the big political stories of 2024 so far, as we'll be having a short break for a couple of weeks. And this gives us a good time to reflect back on some of the major political stories our nation and the world has been through in the past uh, eight months. So in this programme today, I'm joined by uh, Reverend uh, Chris Wickland and together with uh, Melanie Simmons. Uh, Melanie, I I'll start off with you because it's uh, you've got a new Heart edition coming out. And I think the headline uh, of the uh, Heart edition newspaper, the most godless parliament ever, is very fitting, I think, for today's programme. Um, just share with us a little bit about some of the content in, uh, in this month's edition. Right, thank you. Well, um, there was a sense um, when the Lord highlighted that article to me, it, it's a quote from the Times, the most godless parliament ever. I mean, there's a secular paper saying it, and they had a very good article about how most of the MPs hadn't um, sworn on the Bible. Um, quite a lot of the Conservatives did, but of course there's few of them now. Um, lots of MPs hadn't. Um, and that really chimes with the godless agenda of the new government. And I don't know about the viewers, but I personally, as soon as the election result came through, there was a kind of oppression descended, really. It's, uh, we are in a, a, a different season now, and I know Chris has been preaching about that. Uh, we've also got in the paper itself um, <clears throat> a very good feature on cabinet ministers to watch, a bit of their background, what they're keen on, um, such as the Lord Chancellor, who I'm extremely concerned about because she goes on pro-Palestine marches. We've got Ed Miliband cancelling um, uh, North Sea um, oil, and so you know, we could end up with energy shortages and food shortages. And uh, then we've got um, a piece on the outlook for babies on page seven. Um, yes, the cabinet ministers were on page five. We've got um, a very good piece um, on cultural Marxism, page 19 to 20. That's by Andrew Baggerly, who writes an excellent quarterly newsletter. And he's pointing out um, how we now have a government which matches the establishment. The whole establishment is intercultural Marxism, very woke, and now we've got a government which is yeah. like that. Don't forget my good friend Robin Benson. And Robin, ben yes, Robin Benson has done a lovely piece, I said lovely, but um, a, a, a very important piece on the background of Hezbollah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, it's great to see you on, on the programme, Chris, and as we kind of unpack some of the big political news stories of 2024, just share with us your thoughts on what has been essentially an election year around the world. Well, um, it's been a, a white knuckle roller coaster ride. There's been so much happening. You know, it's, the news is moving on so quickly. I mean, it's only a few weeks ago when President Trump was uh, attempted assassination and things are just moving on so quickly and people have forgotten about it already. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's been a really interesting year watching the politics, watching what's been going on in our nation in respect to what's been going on with the protests in the streets of London through most of the major cities and what's been going on politically, how the Labour won by a landslide victory, but it wasn't really that they won, it was that the Conservatives lost and you know it's just the math that pushed them to where they're at. And so we're in a, a really interesting situation. So for me as a pastor and watching the nation from a spiritual point of view and trying to see prophetically where things are at, I'm really, you know, I'm quite concerned, but I'm also quite excited because I find that when we're in this crucible boiling pot that we find ourselves in, that's normally when good men and women rise up to do something special. And it's normally when the church starts to get her act together and she starts praying and then we see some good things. So although it's really bad out there, I'm kind of hoping that that pressure that's coming on our, uh, on our nation will be what gets the church to come onto her knees and we start seeing God move again in our nation. Amen. We're we'll praying for that. And uh, I, I think, Manly, I, because there's so much happened this year, I think we're just going to break down this into kind of uh, three topics. So firstly, the kind of big influence of the Islamists in our, on our general election and also the local elections and the impact that they are having on particularly the Labour Party's new foreign policy, especially towards Israel. And of course, unpacking the uh, general election result and what it means for Christians, having the most secular humanist government in Parliament's history now in, par in, in power as well and their influence and uh, of course unpacking the US presidential election as well which uh, affects all of us. So if we start off really uh, I, I think it's the 
the parachuting in of uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron as uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, we've seen this kind of progression under his leadership in the Foreign Office, which has now been followed up by David Lammy in the Labour Party, that we're starting to see uh, the Conservative government under David Cameron starting to impact Israel in a negative way. Because back in January, we saw that uh, David Cameron called for a Palestinian state. Um, and of course, we know that the, that, uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, uh, is so far away from any peace. But also, I think we've also seen the big demonstrations against Israel, the threats on our democracy, the intimidation against our members of parliament. And we've seen also at the same time, this whole rise of Jew hatred and also with the big uh, pro-Palestinian rallies, this has become a no-go zone for, uh, for Jews on a Saturday going to central London. So just reflect on your thoughts on the Islamist rise and its impact on British politics mm. so far in 2024. Mm. Well, as you're speaking, what's coming to me, of course, is what uh, people call a spirit of dimitude, that there's this big intimidation, uh, intimidating spirit can come across from Islam. And... <laughs> Of course, Islam means submission, doesn't it? But that's to, to their God and not to their, the rest of us. Um, it is concerning, and I'm just seeing, as you're s s talking, it's a spiritual issue. We need to be tackling this spiritually. And we need to be praying that politicians are not intimidated. Now, what I don't quite understand is why, when the Labour uh, government has now got a very comfortable majority... 186? They, they've only got five Islamist MPs who won their seats on the basis of you know, a Gaza ticket, as it were, and George Galloway, interestingly, didn't keep his seat. But why is the Labour government sort of running scared and even um, uh, you know, condoning, not condoning, but the marches, but um, with the foreign policy going becoming actually worse than Cameron, because we did a programme a few months ago talking about uh, Lord Cameron, how concerned we were, but he was milder compared to what we're now seeing. I mean, Definitely. David Lamb has only been in office since 6th of July, call it that, and already there's, um, he, he has revoked um, the British government's opposition to the arrest of Netanyahu and Gallant, the Defence Secretary of Israel and the Prime Minister, um, through the International Criminal Court. He's revoked Britain's um, opposition to that, which is simply awful. And now even worse, I understand that he's going to be um, revoking our um, export licences for British manufacturers to export a few parts for um, Israeli defence equipment. Now, Cameron looked at all of this, and interestingly, he had lawyers in the Foreign Office looking at whether um, Israel had broken the international law in Gaza, and they hadn't. But that was, ve no, you never heard that on the BBC. But they, the Foreign Office lawyers did their job. Oh, nothing to see here. Yep. There actually wasn't. Can add to that uh, the, the restoration of £21 million of British taxpayers' money to be given to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief yeah. Works Agency, and the reason why Britain and many other Western nations suspended their payment to UNRWA is because members of UNRWA, who uh, employ many uh, Gazans into that position, were responsible for carrying out the biggest mass terrorist attack on Israel on October the well, 7th. As you, I previously mentioned, um, my former teaching union, the National Education Union, was paying members' expenses to go on the marches. And I have I pinged them the odd email, the editor of their magazine, which presumably goes to four, all 452 odd thousand members. And they were unbelievably pro Hamas and wanted uh, funding for UNRWA to be uh, um, restored. It was, a, it was discussed at their national conference in April. And also um, now um, it's record that they, they seem to be blind as to what UNRWA is teaching their schools. They are radicalizing those poor Palestinian children. Yeah, uh, and Chris, so back in uh, February of 2024, we saw that uh, George Galloway run the, won the Rochdale uh, by-election campaigning purely on the issue of Gaza. Mm. We see also in March 24 that Robin Sincox, the UK government's commissioner for counter-terrorism, has warned that London has become a no-go zone for Jews at weekends because of the pro-Palestinian protests. Share with us how this year we've seen that the Palestinian cause has been elevated to the highest level of the political um, escalons uh, and how this is one huge issue now 
um, that is influencing the Muslim community in order to put pressure on political parties. And of course, we've seen really uh, the, uh, the Islamists flex their political muscles uh, this year through the local elections, by-elections, but also the general election as well. Share with us this growing influence of uh, political Islam in our country. Yeah, so this, this, to be fair, has been warned about uh, for a long time, for about 25 years, people have been warning that we have a potential Islamic issue in our, nat in our nation which will rise up into politics and will affect lots of different areas. And we, we saw recently what happened in Europe when Le Pen was nearly going to be voting, it looked like, so when they had their second vote, all the leftist parties got together. And, but when you looked at the policies of that leftist party, it had nothing to do with France, it had everything to do with a ceasefire, a ceasefire for Gaza and, uh, and the Palestinian agenda. And again, it was quite clear that the politicians are, are cowering to an Islamic agenda. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing exactly the same thing in our own nation as well. Uh, I was preaching this weekend, I did a, a talk on Judgment Is Coming, talking about the rise of Islam in our country uh, and how we spoke about this on, our, on that last show where, uh, that I did with you with uh, Bonhoeffer was warning about various things in Nazi Germany and we're seeing today um, the modern Marxist kind of ideology marrying itself to this Islamic it's a weird marriage, but they're coming together and putting pressure on Christians and Jews. And, and when we look at things like the country of Iran in 1972, a similar story happened there. You had a very liberal government. Sorry. Is it 71? Yeah. Uh, 79, liberal, 79. 79, sorry. And the liberal government that married a, a itself and allied itself with uh, an Islamic front. And now we, we see the problems that we have in the Middle East with Iran as well. And we're seeing these things in our own nation. For me, it really concerns me. It concerns me um, naturally for my own country. It concerns me spiritually for my own country. And you know, the I saw a letter the other day, it was on TV, that was presented to the Prime Minister. The first thing that some of the Muslim politicians that had been voted in, their first agenda, was to cause for an immediate ceasefire in Palestine and various other things. It was like a list of nine demands. And this had nothing to do with their local constituents. And so quite clearly we got people that are coming into power where their primary agenda is nothing to do with this nation, mm -hmm. but it's to do with another nation. And it's to do more to do with their religion and their ideology and their culture than anything else. That concerns me, that disturbs me. And it amazes me that no one, that not many people, especially politicians, are waking up to this. We're lit I don't know what it is that we could end up with in the next 10 years, but uh, it, what concerns me as well is that we're not even allowed to really talk about these kind of things. For me mm. to say what I'm saying now, some people would brand it as hate speech or would brand it as me being racist. I'm not being racist. I'm talking about a genuine concern for British people. Yeah, we all share that concerns uh, with you as well, Chris, and for the nation. Uh, Manly, uh, the other big uh, topic I think that dominated uh, British politics in 2024 is, is clearly the, uh, the general election. And um, mm. back in May, um, we saw that uh, Rishi Sunak, shortly after the uh, disastrous results in the local elections, uh, called for a general election, which took most of his ministers, most of his um, uh, parliamentary uh, members of parliament, by complete surprise by calling for a general election on the 4th of July. Um, what are your thoughts on Rishi calling for a general election, knowing that he could have waited now <coughs> to the autumn to have actually called an election? Um, it, it was a surprise and um, one wonders what's going on behind the scenes. And um, we know that Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak are members of the World Economic Forum. We've got a photo in the new paper of Keir Starmer when he was last speaking at Davos. And he, of course, he famously said, which do you prefer, Westminster or Davos? And he said Davos, and the official reason was you can get more done there I, you know, without being howled down and held to account. You can just peddle your agenda. And, um, but one wonders why Rishi did that. I would love to know, um, because we, in the previous issue of the paper, we actually had an interview with um, Andrew Bridgen. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say his name. But, um, and he just said it's passing o over the baton of, um, from Rishi to Sir Keir Starmer. And they knew that Labour was going to win, and pretty handsomely. Um, there were thoughts at the time about whether the, the tax position was more favourable at, at that point. Uh, now, we, in the last... 24 hours, we've got Rachel Reeves, a new chancellor, saying that there's this uh, 22 billion black hole. Jeremy Hunt saying, oh, no, there isn't. And we don't know. Um, and it's, I know that um, you know, Chris had a word about the timing of the calling of the election. And 
I, I have no problem believing that. Uh, and one just doesn't know what goes on behind the scenes. But it's not... With the Conservative government, people were very negative about them. And there wasn't a lot of clear blue water between them and Labour mm -hmm. in their... Um, what should we say, their pro-life policies and all the rest of it, which would make them seem conservatives. Yeah, I think that's why reform did well. I mean, I, we, we can't mention the general election 2024 without influ uh, mentioning the influence of reform led by uh, Nigel Farage, who for the first time won a seat in Clacton. Um, I think they now have uh, six seats uh, in Parliament, which is a major political breakthrough for the Reform Party. But of course, that came at the expense of the Conservative Party because it split the Conservative vote, which meant that Labour got a majority of 186. So share with us the influence that Reform has had on the general election and really the difficulty for Christians to know who to actually vote for mm. uh, in the general election that took place on the 4th of July, Chris. Yeah. That's a good question. So, I mean, you know, as a pastor, I would never tell anyone who to vote for. But I do wonder sometimes why Christians do vote things like Green or, forgive me for saying this, if I upset anyone at home, vote Labour. Well done. Be because <laughs> we, it, we have to understand, it. as Christians, we are looking at the, the policies that these governments represent. And obviously we know that we live in a, in a secular world, so obviously there's, there's a limited remit within that for a Christian. But the, my, my concern with conservative is basically they were no longer conservative. You know, you had the liberals were liberals, you had the Labour who were liberal, and then basically conservative were liberal, and they were infighting amongst the, the more traditional conservatives. Mm. And so for me, I, I think the reason why reform did so well uh, it's primarily because many people were being disenfranchised. You had centre, centre, right, and everyone had shifted to the left. And it's like, well, no one's taking, no one's considering my vote or considering my stance. And so reform came along, and you know that's why I personally voted for reform. I knew the damage that it would possibly do to conservatives, and I knew that it was, in some sense, uh, some would say a null vote, so it allowed Labour to come in. But you had you had so well of Braverman as your your member of parliament. I know, I know. But <laughs> at the end of the day, it's uh, it, for me. It was also a protest vote. It was it was to let conservatives know that I feel like I've been disenfranchised, and I I, I stand by conservative values. Um, and so reform were the only party that really were holding that, holding that line. I know Suella Braverman, I, I really love what she stands for, but she is one of very few voices. And so at the end of the day, I had to go with, you know, what would be a, a share, would, would cause a little bit of a ripple to the other governments, the other parties mm. that they would know. You know, so that, that's why I voted reform in the end, just because of the fact that, you know, I just felt like I was being disenfranchised. I think that's why they did, they did quite well. Well, the thing that annoys me with our political system is that they came, what was it, third technically? Was it with the mouse? Yep. And yet, yeah, they only won so many seats, mm. yet uh, the Liberal Democrats won 70 odd seats. Yep. And, uh, 71, that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, just uh, obviously it's, it's always good to give out the actual uh, figures uh, for the general election 2024. Uh, so, the, uh, con so we see that the Conservatives were reduced to just 121 seats, the lowest number of MPs in that 190 year history. Uh, these included high profile losses, uh, losses such as the former Prime Minister Liz Truss, former Cabinet Minister Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, Commons Leader Penny Morden and Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. The Liberal Democrats, led by Sir Ed Davey, achieved their best result ever with 71 seats. The Green Party achieved their best ever results, quadrupling their number of seats to four. Reform Party gained their first seats in Parliament, which includes the uh, party leader Nigel Farage, constituency of Clapton. The SNP suffered heavy losses, uh, going from 48 seats to just nine. Uh, Sinn Féin wins seven seats, making them the largest parliament, uh, sorry, party in Northern Ireland. Um, and of course, the Labour Party now have uh, a majority of uh, 189, which is unprecedented, uh, considering that the Conservative Party won uh, 80 seats at the last election. And now, I just want to kind of bring on in terms of now that we have a new government in place, uh, Labour have a, a super, super majority, means effectively they can do anything that they want. But, but share with us how uh, effectively this is, as you've got on your front page, the most ungodly government in history, that uh, this is the most secular parliament and the most secular government in, in the history of our nation um, and does really reflect the kind of secular values that are echoed by the Labour Party on the nation. Share with us the impact that will have on legislation and direction that this government takes. 
Well, the specu speculating on it is really rather awful. Uh, um, and I, in the paper, just try to warn people things to pray about because it could be simply awful. I mean, we've already touched on the approach towards Israel, you know, complete lack of knowledge of history. How, I mean, how can you have a, you know, a, a Lord Chancellor and the Secretary of State for Justice who thinks there's such a thing as a Palestinian state, or ever has been? You know, it, it, it's. You th we're almost in an age where history doesn't matter, where people can make it up. And I suppose we're sort of seeing that in AI. You can make it up as you go along. Um, we've had, you were mentioning the MPs have gone, some good pro-life MPs like Fiona Bruce, who also stood up for persecuted Christians have gone as well. Caroline Ansell from Eastbourne. Um, and uh, you know, I, I agree with Chris, I voted similarly um, because I felt one had to, you know, the Lord was watching and yet you knew it was going to have this awful result. Yeah, I mean, it was hard election. It was hard to know who to vote yes. for. But I'm not going to say who, who but, I actually yes, vote for. Yes, but it, it, it's um, so then the things they're going to come up with, it's sort of like fasten your seatbelts because we've got Diana Johnson and Stella Creasy back in Parliament, um, very keen on decriminalising abortion up to birth. But we've got um, Ed Miliband as the energy secretary um, who believes in all the carbon stuff. And um, we... we He's t buying these, um, or want, want to, uh, um, on behalf of the government, um, buying up farmland in, in Norfolk to, to put um, solar uh, panels on. And where do they go when they've um, expired? You know, there's no sort of, you can't recycle them. Whereas there is a threat to the food production. So we've really got to be praying because, the, the, you know, the, the Bible says, pray for your government that you may live a peaceful life. Amen to lot. Yeah. Yep. And um, uh, Chris, I want to move on to the other side of the Atlantic because what happens uh, in the United States and who wins the presidential election on the uh, 5th of November will have a huge impact uh, on our lives uh, here in Britain and across the world. So share with us your thoughts on what has been the most dramatic uh, political developments uh, in decades. Uh, firstly, we know that uh, Joe Biden had a dreadful presidential election debate against um, uh, former president and president Donald Trump, uh, followed by the attempted assassination on Donald Trump. Uh, thankfully, that failed. And then we see that, that uh, Joe Biden uh, was forced to resign as US president. And then we see uh, that his vice president, Kamala Harris, will now be the um, Democratic presidential nominee uh, for the Democratic Party and she will face off against Trump uh, on November the 5th. So share with us what's, if we think our politics is interesting, what are your thoughts on what's happening in the States? Well, with respect, um, I think it's a complete farce. Um, the, how Trump was treated after the assassination attempt um, by the Democrats was quite shocking. You know, if, it was, if this was done 20 years ago, there would have, I think the response you would have got across all of America, they would have all been stunned. But again, you're getting this whole thing where America's really divided right now. And what happened with Trump is, is a good example of that division. Um, I don't know a lot about Kamala Harris, but what I've seen of her, I'm not particularly, I, dare, I shouldn't say this probably, but I'm not impressed by her. Um, she's not what I would call presidential material at all. But hey, she ticks all the, the inclusive and diverse uh, things. She's colored, she's a woman, uh, first black woman pri um, president of America. Well, that would be a great thing for America, right? So, so the inclusive guys would say, I, I think the whole thing is a mess. And I think Trump will probably be what America needs, but then at the same time, he's as a divisive, very divisive man for many. So, you know. The, the choices that America are left with are difficult, but I think Trump would probably be the best for America strategically, militarily as well. And also having someone with a good business head um, at, the, at the table would be good as well. But my honest opinion is, is what we're seeing out in America is very similar to what we've got going on in our own country. We've got a very divided nation and, uh, and quite scary politics going on right now. Politics that 20 years ago you would never get away with. Mm. But we're seeing it now and it's, it's, we're living in, in a media cycle that's so quick. You know, the fact that, pre that uh, President Trump got shot at the other week is, oh, we've moved on now, it's, 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 uh, we've got some memes about him and now we've just moved on to the next news story. You know, this is, this is a major, major news story that should be, still be circulating, but we've forgotten about it now, we're not talking about it now. 
but actually to take away the freedom of democracy by assassinating someone because you don't like him just shows where we're at really, or shows where they're at as a nation. And I, I would say we're not probably close, far close behind ourselves. Yeah, and with about two minutes to go for the programme, Manley, um, just spell out why the US presidential election is important, not only for Christians in the States, but also uh, Christians here and, and how whoever wins the White House will set the agenda for the next four years. Well, I come back to Israel. I mean, President Trump um, moved the US Embassy to Jerusalem. Um, he is on good terms with the current Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. And because Britain likes to, to some extent, be on the same page as the Americans, um, if he was back in the White House, then as regarding Israel, that would be a good influence on our foreign policy. I don't think we would have the nerve to be quite so um, provocative as we are. So if you'd like me, Foreign Secretary, with uh, Trump as uh, president, that could quite spot rude fireworks. About him, wasn't he? Yes. Very rude. Very yes. rude. Yeah. Uh, and and, and um, summing up, uh, uh, Chris, um, how as Christians should we be watchful and prayerful, uh, particularly as we see these kind of major political developments? And, and it reminds me of what Jesus said in, in Matthew 24 that one of the major signs before his coming is political turbulence in the nations. Yeah. And this is this, and the perplexity of problems that they don't know how to deal with or handle. Yeah, I, I, I think the church needs to be like the sons of Issachar at this time. We just need to open our eyes and, and see the signs of the times in which we're living in. And again, we've had this discussion before. I think the church thinks that she should somehow become apolitical. It's, well, it's all about the kingdom of God. It's not about politics and stuff. But actually, you know, it's, it's Christians that got their hands dirty in the past mm -hmm. that actually caused good policies and good things for this nation. And I think if there's ever a time, as I said before, that the church should get involved in politics and in the narrative of today, it has to be now. And the church needs a prophetic voice into the now, for now, not just for now, but for the next generation. Excellent. So Chris and Manley, thank you so much for being my guests on this week's Politics Day. You've both done a great job. And I want to thank you for watching uh, this uh, programme at home. Uh, there can be no doubt that uh, we've had a very dramatic political year, essentially a year of elections where we've seen a Labour government win a majority of 189 in the House of Commons, become the most secular parliament and government in our nation's history. We've seen the influence of the Islamist votes on our, on our government and also on our elections. But of course, it all hangs in the balance to see what happens on Thursday, the 5th of November, when the American people decide who they're going to elect as their next president. Keep watching, keep praying, because it matters. So thank you for watching this week's edition of Politics Today.